understand uh, uh, emerging market business cycles, what we're trying to understand is what shocks are important? What are they, first of all? What shocks are important? What frictions are important? And to what extent do the frictions matter in intermediating shocks into outcomes? So let me give you an example here. We would think of in a standard advanced economy framework, we would typically model technological progress as being transitory, right? In other words, it goes up and it kind of comes down again. Okay. But in the paper that we will consider today, you could think of a productivity shock being permanent. And the way to model a productivity shock being permanent is to model a shock in its trend. In other words, we'll consider a trend productivity shock. So one issue that may be important is trend versus a temporary productivity shock. Okay? So this can be seen as a permanent productivity shock. And it's permanent because when you raise the trend level of productivity, the trend growth in the productivity, you um, are raising a permanent income. You're not only raising your income now, but you're raising your income in the future as well. So you're raising permanent income. So this is one issue. So <coughs> It's permanent trend versus temporary, so you could have something, some thinking on that for the analysis. Then, in terms of the frictions, um, let's take uh, working capital constraints. That's an example of a financial market friction. Make sense? Okay, so working capital constraints, as we'll see later on today, is uh, a point where a firm is unable to pay its workers its wage payments at the time that production is realized. So once you have to, you have to pay workers now, and production is going to happen later on. So you have to pay a fraction of that to, uh, to workers who issue debt to basically finance that. So that's a friction. So to what extent are these important for explaining your outcomes? And then your outcomes are what you see in the data. So these are your stylized facts. So what the empirical analysis should do is um, one thing that we sometimes do is match moments, right? But you could also have um, more likelihood-based measures. So you could do a Bayesian estimation of the posterior distribution parameters and use those to generate inputs responsible functions. Now this is a part of the macro that is very, very weak in India. But it's still in the art. I mean, if you look at any advanced kind of any top paper in the top journal, it's typically looking at both likelihood based measures as well as matching moments to look at the goodness of the fit of the model. Okay? And then there are various decompositions. So, is the observed data explained, is, is X percent of the observed data is explained by a trend shock, uh, 1 minus X is explained by a temporary shock. Uh, and so on. So there's a variant decomposition. So you could augment your uh, matching of moments with more likelihood based measures, which requires you to estimate the model. Um, and that allows you to address a whole set of issues um, in this particular in this particular sequence. So remember, shocks, the kinds of friction that are prevalent, and then you have outcomes. Now, the basic workforce model is basically the stochastic growth model. It's a small open economy RBC model. Okay? So there is Mendoza 1991 AER. And if you take Mendoza 1991 AER and you augment that framework with trend shocks along the lines that I'll talk about, This leads to Aguiar Gopinath 2007. And then you can throw in frictions that are specific to your country or that are not been covered by the literature, and that just gives you something that is more augmented. But that's basically the story, is that you have a small open economy RBC model, stochastic growth model, but it's small open economy. And it's augmented with trend shocks. Okay. Sir, in the Gopinath paper, there is also thing about trend stability and trend is that what you are saying that the stability of trend in economies would differ, so we are trying to factor that into the economy? I'll talk about all of that. 
later on when we talk about estimating the parameters. Okay. So there's a standard deviation for the estimate and then you're estimating the auto correlation coefficient. So we'll discuss that later. I'm just trying to give you a bird's eye view of the literature. What I'm trying to say is that the way to think about EME business cycles is to think about the shocks that are hitting your economy, think about the frictions that are specific to your economy, and then either using likelihood based measures or impulse response of functions to generate time series and do matching moments to see if your empirical regularities match up with what you are trying to explain. That's the broad sequence that I want you to think about uh, fluctuations. But this stuff basically gives you um, an impl implication that explains some of the data. I'll talk about this. The identifying mechanism here is something called the permanent income hypothesis. And the trend shock to productivity is a rise in your permanent income. Right? That induces the household to, to, to consume out of its current income. And that's what generates the higher consumption volatility. But I'll formalize that in a bit. But that's what this is. Then on the interest rate shock side, um, you have the famous paper um, dating back to 2005, that's Norma and Perry. And then there's something similar with endogenous credit spreads, uh, which is Uribe and Yu, uh, which I think is also Journal of Monetary Economics. Um, and then there are various extensions to this. Uh, uh, but a nice paper that has recently come out in the IAR is Roberto Chang and uh, Fernandez. And they talk, and I think this is really kind of unifying. This is a, a unified framework. Okay, it's a unified framework, and they actually call it an encompassing framework. And the reason why it's an event encompassing framework is that it has trend plus temporary plus frictions. And then it allows the model to either accept or reject a variety of hypotheses on the relative importance of these variables. Okay, so it has conclusions about the importance of trend and uh, temporary shocks, and it has conclusions about the relative importance of two frictions endogenous spreads and working capital constraints. The importance of an encompassing model is this, is that if you just try and explain a bunch of regularities that is fairly stripped down, the question is how robust is this to the inclusion of frictions and other variables in the economy. So, but the upshot of the Chong Fernandez paper is that if you don't have frictions, then trend shocks tend to be important. But as you begin to add frictions, the relative importance of trend shocks seems to go down. Okay, so it matters for your model as to what combination of these things you, 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 you build up your model. Okay, so that's just a bird's eye view of the literature. That's pretty much the state of the art at the moment. That's where we are in terms of thinking about fluctuations. Uh, there is a large kind of sorbo debt literature, and I don't want to get into that. Um, but that kind of is parallel to this whole thing, but this is what we will focus on, focus on today. Okay, now. So all of you have seen these notes, right? You've got a copy of these notes? Okay, so let's run through this. Um, so there's this huge literature on, on developed economy uh, uh, stylized tax. And you guys are all familiar with the uh, one sector stochastic growth model, right? On how to set it up and solve it and take the data and to um, generate a post response functions and, and, and then match moments. Uh, and that's kind of inspired, um, and there's a bit, you know, there's been a lot of interest now in emerging markets in part because um, a lot of them have had high growth rates, uh, they're large, um, so that's inspired uh, a literature on the empirical regularities of EMD business cycles, um, and in some work a couple of years ago, um, uh, two co-authors and I took a stab at, at kind of uh, what, what, what India looks like as a basis for theorizing about it. That was the idea. And in subsequent work with uh, Bauer over here, uh, uh, we make an attempt to theorize about the empirical regularities of, of, of Indian facts. And I think this is a part of a macro research which I think is extremely important but is under-researched. Um, uh, certainly abroad, there's a lot of interest uh, on India by Indians living in India. Uh, but it seems like that interest kind of 
wanes in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a broader sense. So if you look at cutting edge research, generally through the models with pulse for other indications for India, in other words, looking at Indian macro problems through the lens of North American macro, uh, that tends to be a very small group of, of people kind of working on it. And I think that's an area of work that needs to be, needs to be encouraged. And then there's this also this very exciting research agenda that people are working on. Um, it's not that work on EMEs is not being done. A lot of work on EMEs is being done. But looking at India specifically, I feel that this, this is an area that is, that is under research, kind of in a North American sense. Not that it's not being done. There's a lot of work that is being done in a kind of DSG sense. Uh, this is interesting. So here's what we'll do. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what is a growth cycle um, and various ways to extract the cycle using an HP filter and the relative efficacy of an HP filter versus a backstripping filter. Last time I went over this in depth and it was kind of useless because I think people knew this. So I'll skip through this. Um, let me report what we find for India as a basis for theorizing about it and then talk a little bit about whether an equilibrium approach is useful for understanding the Indian empirical regularities. And this is the slow approach here, which I think is um, it's useful to organize it in this way, is that you have to organize it in terms of thinking about the types of shocks and their uh, either, for instance, whether they're they're trend shocks or or and, and then that they're permanent or temporary, or whether they're interest rate shocks or other kinds of shocks. Um, you want to think about the frictions, and then you also want to think a little bit about the criticisms. I'll talk a little bit about the criticisms of about the Arab because that's a well-known paper that was published. And then there are issues related to solving the model, calibration, and estimation. Um, so all of you who have gone through uh, PhDs in macro or are going through them. Um, so there's these issues of uh, what uh, solution technique you adopt to solve uh, a large kind of linear rational expectation model. Um, and the one that is convenient and nice to teach to grad students is Ulick's general approach. I don't know if you're familiar with it or if you've used it. It allows you to linearize the model and then write it in a, in a, in a, in a state space form, which then uses um, some results in matrix algebra to give you the uh, uh, endogenous states in terms of the exogenous states of the shocks. And then once you are able to get that representation, you can shock the variables and get your impulse responses. Is that familiar to people? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, Neumar and Perry, for instance, use that approach to, uh, to calculate their, their decision rules. Uh, and we do, we do also in our, in, our, in, our business cycle, in our business cycle paper. So that's, that's the whole set of issues. And then this whole set of issues relating to, to Bayesian estimation, uh, which I'm less of a, of a person on. Uh, but are you guys uh, estimating your models? Um, has anybody done a Bayesian estimation of your model? Okay. Um, okay, good. So it's calibration and estimation, is that right? Okay, so some of the parameters you've calibrated and some you've been able to. Okay, so that's that's very much the way to kind of go and think about it in, in, in terms of in terms of these models, and then and then we'll conclude. Okay, um, um, so this is kind of no, but it doesn't hurt to point out that we're looking at growth cycles. Right? So the HP filters are actually going to deliver a growth cycle, and the difference is that whereas in the classical business cycle the trough or the down point would be the absolute deviation and the absolute peak, which would be A and B. In a growth cycle, you're looking at the maximum distance relative to trend. So it wouldn't be A and B, but it would rather be C and D. That would pick up the troughs for the growth cycle, which would be, um, you know, which would be, which would be estimated through a filtering technique um, like the HV filter, okay? Now, the classical component, you would think, therefore, would have a slightly shorter recession because it's in an absolute sense, and therefore the trend is still kind of there. So that should enable the economy to pick up faster. So when you measure things using the classical cycle, you would expect the economy to have a slightly smaller recession. But when you're looking at, at growth cycles, you're looking at departures from trends, and that leads to uh, a, a slightly different interpretation. So those are just definitions. Expansion is just movement from trough to peak. So in emerging markets and developing economies, the movement from trough to peak takes different amount of years. Uh, recession is movement from peak to trough. This is also typically uh, something that people working in the empirical literature say it takes, you know, documented this takes a different number of years. Um, then there's 
duration, which is the length of time the economy spent between the trucks and peaks, and the amplitude. So we'll talk about the empirical evidence documented in a paper by Rand and Tarr, which actually estimates these relative to advanced economies. Although in this literature here, where we're trying to look, in, where we're trying to look at uh, moments, uh, in other words, relative standard deviations, uh, autocorrelations, cross-correlations, and so on, um, that's not really the main focus. The main focus is trying to understand um, moments in the data as opposed to uh, duration. Okay, so um, uh, basically an HP filter decomposes a series into a, um, into a trend component and into a cyclical component. Is that kind of clear? Okay. Uh, so you can think of YT being, uh, let's say, a log series. The nice thing about the HP filter is that you can um, kind of apply it to, 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 to even to non-stationary series, although there's a well-known criticism uh, about uh, the HP filter generating uh, a spurious cycles if you apply it to integrated series. This is a criticism by Cotley and Nason uh, that I'll report later on. But um, <clears throat> think of a series that can be decomposed between a trend component and a cyclical component, and then there's going to be a minimization problem that, that, that allows you to calculate the uh, that 50? Trend. Trend, right? So you're going to, you're going to, you're going to choose in this minimization problem, you're going to have two components. So this is just going to be kind of a deviation uh, from the, from the trend, right? So this is kind of like the cyclical part. And this, this second term here is, is what? The second term here is like delta squared, so very close to uh, delta square xt, approximates delta square xt. But this is a, 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 so if you think of delta x, xt being the trend or the first derivative, you can think of delta square xt being an acceleration of the trend. So you're picking, you're minimizing this function, this last function, by choosing xt, right, that minimizes this deviation subject to a weight that you put on a term that captures how fast the trend is accelerating. And the larger lambda is, the larger the penalty you put on to the fact that the trend is accelerating at some amount. That's the rationale of the HP filter. So if lambda is large, your growth component, which is that thing on the right, uh, you basically get a much more, a smoother, a smoother time series so in your, in your data. So this lambda is going to be equal to, uh, it's going to be called the smoothing parameter. Uh, and that's what you saw. Okay. So, um, so this is the tension, right, that you get. Now, you're going to be choosing um, uh, in here, so you can salt out for, this, uh, for, these, for these conditions. And so you have 10 observations uh, in your time series. So yt is a particular observation in time period t, but it goes from t equals 1 to 10, let's say 20 periods. Okay? So you get these things over here, and then from C2 to Cn minus 1, you can basically write this as C equals lambda fx, so that if you plug it back into this equation, you get this. And that allows you to invert and find x hat equals to lambda plus i inverse y, and back out c hat equals y minus x hat. Y is, of course, the data. x hat is the uh, optimized x, so that allows you to get the uh, C hat from it. But there's other things that are peculiar about the HP filter. One is that from t equals 3 to n minus 2, you can actually write ct as lambda delta 4xt, which is, looks like a, it's, it's a nice statistical thing, but it doesn't seem it's devoid of, of economic, economic meaning. So that's one thing that is, that is of issue, although not a major issue, but tends to be of issue amongst people working in this area. And then there's some other uh, uh, Nice things about the, uh, the HP filter that I think it was okay. One of the criticisms. Um, um, so this is this issue about uh, um, if you're going to be extracting the trend, right? So why do we need to use an HP filter to do that? Why don't you just linearly detrend? What assumptions do we make about linearly detrending a model and then just calculating the cycle from that and saying that that's something we want to measure uh, business cycles with. What assumption do we have on linear detrending that makes that possibly unappealing way to extract the cycle? Huh? So they're 
I mean, yeah, that's, that's right. So that's right. So, okay, so let's back that up with some examples. What you're assuming when you detrend linearly is that uh, your shocks are, are neutral in the long run. Now, some kinds of shocks may be neutral in the long run. Right? What are examples of shocks that are probably neutral in the long run? If you're like a monetary policy shock. Right? And kind of everything goes back to, 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 back to the steady state. But there could be some shocks that are more permanent in nature. Right? So technological innovations are examples of shocks that are more permanent in nature. Right? So a technological innovation has a permanent effect, and that effect is replaced by another innovation that comes along in the future and replaces its effect. So that may not particularly be neutral. So linear detrending isn't a particularly good way to take out the cycle. And the HP filter seems to work despite its despite its criticisms, but we want to be aware of the fact that it generates for cycles uh, under a variety of conditions. Then there's a, bad, bad, a Baxter King filter, which is a band pass filter. Um, so the little base, um, uh, it, it, it operates in a band, right? So it accepts cycles of particular frequencies above a certain cutoff, and then it eliminates cycles of frequencies below a particular cutoff. And that, that's what gives you um, the band interpretation. Um, it's approximated, the filtered series is approximated by an infinite order moving average uh, of that type. Um, and that's what you get with the uh, uh, generation of the filter. Okay, now, what we get uh, in developed versus developing countries, so let's just see what happens when we, uh, when we do this. And I guess from a research standpoint, um, you can start off by using the HP filter to uh, determine the cyclical properties of your data, and then use the Baxter King filter to look at robust issues. issues. Uh, that's one way to proceed. So, what we find is that output is less volatile in developed economies, it's more volatile in developing economies. And a lot of the EMP empirical literature, and we find this for India too, um, more or less supports with this story. You have higher output volatility, right? Um, you also have consumption being less volatile than output but consumption being more volatile than output. That's one issue that happens. Um, again, it's not sacrosanct, so there are advanced economies where you have higher consumption volatility, but by and large in emerging market economies, you tend to see uh, consumption being less volatile, uh, consumption being more volatile than output. Then you have investment being volatile in developed economies, being highly volatile in developing economies. Government expenditures are counter-cyclical, there's no consistent relation, although in many EMEs it tends to be pro cyclical. In other words, when there's a boom, the government spend more. Okay, so this is also subject to a lot of theory. Um, consumer prices are counter cyclical. Here you have no consistent relation. And here the interpretation sometimes given is whether they're counter cyclical or pro cyclical allows you to identify whether um, the shocks sitting in your system are coming from the supply side or coming from the demand side, right? That's uh, one thing that comes up. Then you have investment being pro cyclical and being three times as volatile as output. Um, the investment correlation is weak. Imports are pro cyclical. That makes sense. If your income goes up, you import more, so that's pro cyclical. Imports correlation is weak. You have weakly counter cyclical net exports. Uh, in some countries, you actually have, uh, yeah, it's weakly counter cyclical net exports. And here you have strongly counter cyclical net exports. Okay? So that's a broad um, distinguished. Uh, 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 broad set of facts for both developed and developing economies. Now, a little brief policy do detour onto um, India. So, when you do this, the back of it, there are all kinds of structural changes going on. Um, one is kind of moving away from a planned economy to a market economy. Uh, one is uh, the diminishing role of agriculture, and therefore uh, the need to look at non agricultural output and check robustness with respect to that. And then there's also this issue of how to treat the post-1991 period versus the pre-1991 period where, um, you know, one largely understands the Indian uh, uh, policy trajectory as follows is that it was stuck in a, a low-growth uh, regime for about three decades after independence. And then there was ad hoc trade liberalization in the 80s coupled with expansion fiscal policy, which led to a burst in growth in the mid to mid 80s. 
that led to a balance of payments crisis, um, that led to a movement towards uh, a variety of, of, of first generation economic reforms, uh, largely on the side of product markets, not so much on factory markets. Uh, and, then, and then you know the story from there. So there's, there's this issue of 91 uh, being a critical point, there's this issue of moving from socialism to or applying the economies to, to something that's more market oriented, and moving from autarky towards something that is more open. So here's the transition from agriculture, it's steep decline. This is also of interest to people working on structural transformation because if the output has fallen, um, employment doesn't mimic this graph, which it does in, in, in lots, of, lots of other uh, uh, developed economies, for instance. If you look at the employment, uh, uh, agriculture employment numbers, they're, they're relatively flat. So then again, when you think of theory, you have to think about models that generate this. Okay? There has to be, you, you can't do this because if you just had um, a demand side, if you had a hybrid model, so I've worked a little bit on these models and they're interesting is that if you have, for instance, what would give something like this are non homothetic preferences in some way, it could either be subsistence consumption or it could have um, semi linear preferences, and then on the supply side, you could have differential total factor product productivity across that. That in a standard kind of two sector growth model would generate declining shares for some sectors and increasing shares for some sectors. But here what you want to explain is a declining share and then a flat employment share. So you need to throw in a friction in there to basically get that get that thing like a tax or, or some other mechanism that slows down employment's movement up to the other sectors, uh, even though one was contracting quite fast. Okay, so that's the share of agricultural GDP declining. These are gross flows, okay, on both the capital and current account. They've surged over the years. Um, so this is delta L, which is the change in liabilities. It's the foreign ownership of domestic assets. By the way, this is gross flows, right? So you can typically think of gross flows versus net flows. And then delta A is basically domestic holdings of foreign assets. This is gross flows. And you see this to be increasing over time. And it coincides with our growth spur. If you look at 2003 to 2008, it's a huge spur in, um, in, uh, in capital flows. So, transition from autarky, that's changed. And then, theorizing about this, some of the complaints that I've got under FP reports, for instance, is should you really be using a small open economy, uh, equilibrium business cycle approach to thinking about India? Uh, India is complicated, right? It's got uh, uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of frictions and issues. And, uh, and is this a reasonably good approximation? And we, we say yes, at a first pass, may not be that bad. Because if you think of, um, if you look at, rather, if you look at FDI inflows, they're more or less, so this is, you know, one and a half to three percent. Uh, India is somewhere in the middle. So it's not at the bottom, though. It, it's, it's not at the top, but it is somewhere in the middle. So FDI inflows are comparable. And then if you look at the uh, lane Ferretti measure of, uh, 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 which looks at the stock of all liabilities and uh, assets as a percentage of GDP. Um, that also is, is, is somewhat bunched up over here. So India is the black, uh, this is 0.6 and this is 1.2, um, somewhat at the bottom, but it's not really down here. Uh, so and if, as a first pass, the small open economy assumption may not be that bad of an approximation thinking about fluctuations in India, for instance, uh, on a variety of measures. But this is something that you'll get in referee reports when you think about India, is, is, is to what extent is it relevant to use the equilibrium business cycle approach. Okay, so uh, let's now apply the HP filter and the Baxter King filter. I'll just report the results on what we find um, in the, uh, to the Indian data. Any questions? There are two new entrants here. Can you guys introduce yourselves? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Ian Massey. I'm the Baxter King Okay. Are you doing a doctor somewhere or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're learning. Okay. I'm Antra. I work at Catalyst Institute of Social Sciences in India. Okay. And I've done my PhD at the field. In economics? Yes. And public finance, public business, and public business. Okay. So is this stuff familiar to you or? More or less. More or less. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we will use um, uh, these filters to extract a specific set of uh, uh, empirical regularities for for Indian data. Okay. Um, 
One limitation in the Indian context is the availability of data at the quarterly frequency. We know for GDP we can get these numbers from 96 onwards. Uh, annual data we have that goes much further. Uh, we do ours from 1950 onwards. Um, but that tends to be something uh, limiting. And then, but you do have quarterly data for GDP from 96 onwards and for other variables from uh, a little later. So at least allows you to, to uh, generate some facts. And um, this is what those facts look like. So if you look at um, the pre-reform period, I'll just summarize what I think are interesting takeaways from this table. So, this is what you get for a wide variety of, of nominal and, and real variables for the Indian economy from 1950 to 1991 uh, and 1990 to 2010. So this is going to be the basis for theorizing about India. Okay? So this is the kind of work that nobody likes to do, but everybody wants somebody else to do. So now that it is out there, it's open to critiques, replication. You guys can take the data, try and replicate it. And extend it, you know, we go down for five more years compared to 2010. But what we find from uh, this table is what I think are, is interesting. There's more stuff that is interesting. Uh, the volatility of key macro variables has fallen in the post reform period. So that's a bit akin to uh, uh, the great moderation that the vast economies have experienced. Although the great moderation, uh, usually refers to low inflation uh, in, in, in developed economies. But it is also sometimes used to uh, 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 argue that volatility in these economies have fallen down. And that's uh, manifest with the fact that agricultural, which is a volatile sector, has gone down in importance. It's partly driven by the fact that agriculture is a smaller sector. Okay. But volatility has gone down. There's been an increase um, in consumption volatility. And that's interesting. Um, so there's one issue about whether uh, the increase in consumption volatility is because um, it's driven by a trend shock, and Aguilar and Gopinath are going to interpret these shocks as, uh, uh, as coming from the fact that emerging market economies experience changes in their economic policy regime frequently, and that can be seen as, an, an, as a real-life example of a, of a, of a trend shock. Uh, our sense is that it's also driven largely by decreases in sigma y, the relative volatility of output, which in turn is driven by the fact that agriculture has become less important. But consumption volatility has gone up. And you could then also say that, well, this also coincides with a period where, if you look at the main uh, uh, investing variety measures, where openness has also increased, where capital inflows have also increased, um, maybe there's something to do with, 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 with effects of those variables on overall volatility. Okay, now in terms of the pro cyclicality of investment, investment um, in a planned economy which partly responded to boosts in output uh, because of all the all the restrictions is much more responsible responsive to changes in output. It goes up from 0.2 to 0.7. You get increased pro cyclicality of imports. Imports are an increasing function of income. If income goes up, people buy more. Before it was hardly there. And now imports increase orbit business cycle activity, which is typical of advanced economies. Then you get this counter cyclical net exports. You don't find X to be too pro cyclical. I mean, that makes sense because X depends on other countries' performances, right? So if other countries do well, then X does well. Um, if, you could, if you're doing well, then you're other, then other countries are not doing well. X and the other do well. But N is significantly pro cyclical. So every time there's an upturn, X doesn't move, and M moves. So this gives you a counter cyclical net export, okay? And then you also have a counter cyclical nominal exchange rate, which means that um, it goes up in bad times. This is a depreciation actually. Usually when you say, um, this is the nominal exchange rate, right? Uh, the extent to which a nominal exchange rate maps into changes in the real exchange rate depends on P and B stock, the relative price level. Um, but it goes up in bad times, and it tends to pick up stronger and stronger over the time. Yeah? If the nominal exchange rate is depreciated um, in inter-cyclically, can you separate that out of the, like, can you separate the output effect on net exports between um, rest of world performance and, because, like, you know, the whole, you're more competitive when you're depreciated. 
So can you separate you can. those two things? You, I, I have not, but it is typical to do that. So if you, for instance, look at the number of months, for instance, in which a currency is appreciated um, in a trade-weighted sense, because you trade, so your currency has to be uh, adjusted, the appreciation has to be adjusted in a trade-weighted sense, you can do a decomposition exercise and figure out to what extent that exports have tracked that change in the currency. Have they gone down? Have they gone up? But that's not something we've done here. Uh, but sure, that's something that you, that's something that you can do. Uh, anyway, that's, those are all kind of interesting takeaways for, our, for, for the Indian data. Yeah? Uh, is the movement of the dollar exchange rate case in the case of the fact that um, the, the currency wasn't, yeah. yeah, the currency wasn't allowed to really, really float until 1991. Right. And that was the big fear. In fact, in 1991, was, was there was a group in the finance industry that was arguing that you should let the currency just float and go, and people thought it would just plummet versus uh, people who said that you should hold on to it. So it's, 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 I mean, the analysis prior to 1991 is a bit murky with the fact that there's severe exchange rate controls, right? Um, the question is whether in the post-1991 period, whether in the symmetric, what we seem to be picking up is, um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just one of the directions. Yeah, you have to check in the post-1991 period. It's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there any, uh uh, inclusivity about the prices, whether they are for cyclical or non-cyclical. Yeah, um, so we do that. So we get things from the CPI, uh, inflation. So this suggests that CP by inflation, contemporaneous correlation is, is negative, right? So you're getting a, a negative contemporaneous correlation, and over here, you're getting a, uh, a positive uh, contemporaneous uh, correlation. A negative contemporaneous correlation would just mean that if you had a um, yeah, PY and you had ADAS, what would a negative contemporaneous correlation mean? If you had a demand shock hitting your economy, which stimulated your aggregate demand curve, then Y and P would go up both. So that would be a positive contemporaneous correlation. So what this seems to be suggesting is that it's those demand shocks that seem to be characterized by the post-91 data. But the negative shock would occur, so you would have this, so Y goes up. Y goes down rather than P goes up, so you get this inverse thing. So this is saying that it seems like in the pre-91 period, it is supply shocks that seem to be predominant in characterizing the uh, output in Okay, so we generate um, some, something that we think is useful in comparison to other countries. Then there's this issue of whether there's a statistical significance difference in correlation, right? It could be that those numbers are different, but they're not different in a significant way. So you can run these tests, and for some uh, they are, but for a lot, uh, 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 a lot they are, and some they are not. All the ones that are starred represent a statistically significant difference in, uh, in correlation across the two sample periods, 50 to um, 91, and 91 to 2010. Then one robustness check is whether, well, okay, 50 to 91 is, um, uh, uh, how many time periods? 50 to 91 is roughly 40 time periods, and 91 to 2010 is, uh, in the annual data is 20. So what you really want to compare is 1970 to 1991 and 91 to 2010. So we do that, nothing changes in the business cycle regularities, and um, um, I'll report the, then we do it with the quarterly numbers on the Baxter game and nothing changes again. Uh, in terms of the takeaways that I had outlined before, in terms of higher consumption volatility, more countercyclical net exports, more pro-cyclical imports, higher, higher volatility investment. Those guys don't change whether you look at them in terms of, of uh, quarterly data or whether you, you extract the cycle using uh, the Baxter, Baxter peak filter. Um, now, the question is, um, so we see this lower volatility, so is this good luck or is it, you know, or is it really good policy? I mean, do we see this moderation happening because better policies are being implemented? Or is it that either shocks have become more benign and that's what's driving more volatility, or you have better policies? So now if you, um, this is a huge area of work here is estimating sectoral TFP levels in India. For any people who are working on it, a nice set of robust numbers would be really, really good. 
So these numbers were generated by NIPFB, uh, by a few people working there. So when you extract the cyclical part of the TFP, you can actually see that its standard deviation has actually risen in the 1991 period. So you have more varying uh, productivity shocks that are hitting your, your economy. So if that's the case, if it was, if it was due to, if the decline in volatility was due to more benign shocks, that's not the case here because the shock is not more benign on the productivity side. Now, um, the cyclical component of crude, India is a major importer of crude oil, right? So then the pass through, through um, oh, all the sectors that appear in poor inflation, like plastics and transportation, the rest of the Dutch are in poor. That would suggest that more volatility here, um, again, um, uh, should translate into actually more volatile numbers. But since we see less volatile numbers, what this actually says is that it's probably due to this strong evidence that the fact that numbers are less volatile means that it is due to better policies because we do have more volatile shocks. Okay. So that analysis leads us to the conclusion that this quality of macro management is improved um, despite the fact that we're being hit by uh, higher, higher, higher shocks, higher, more, vol more volatile and higher durable shocks. So this is what we see as, 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 being, as being some takeaways that come from, um, uh, from, our, from our transition uh, numbers in the pre-reform and, and post-reform post post period. Okay. Yeah, and then these are the quarterly numbers. If you look at the quarterly numbers from 99, the reason why we start from 99 is that even though we have GDP numbers from 96, we have more data from 1999. Again, if you look at relative uh, consumption volatility, it is higher. Um, uh, uh, this is a real puzzle, is that your real interest rates are actually pro-cyclical, okay? And this is going to be an important point of departure from Aguiar, Gopinath, and uh, and from Neumar and Perry. It requires us to rethink theory, okay? Because you want to explain the effect of these kinds of shocks to their effect on existing fictional on outcomes, but now you have the situation where the real interest rate is pro-cyclical. And um, if any of you are working in this area, I would love for you to be able to, to replicate this number uh, using a variety of other money market rates or Bond yield rates. Um, it would be, be really great to, 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 to signify. But th th there is a working paper by um, a researcher at uh, the Royal, Royal Holloway College in London, and who shows that for lots of countries, this, the interest rate is possible, but it's not counter cyclical. And, and as we'll see in the Donar Ferry model, that's a key way to generate um, the empirical regularities in business cycles uh, using interest rate shocks. But the interest rate is counter cyclical. But here we have uh, a pro cyclical interest rate. Coupled with a counter-cyclical current balance or counter-cyclical current account. Okay, so that's going to require some explaining. These are just lots of the detailed path key variables with GDP using quarterly data for India. Um, and then um, this is generating these numbers once again using the backstripping filter. And over here, what you see is that uh, again consumption tends to be this relative standard deviation is one point one, it's higher, so you get higher consumption volatility also in the uh, data using the backstripping uh, filter. So, uh, so uh, yeah. from the previous slide, uh, what can you infer about the long term interest rate? Will we obtain liquidity effect for India? How strong is that? Uh, so, I see the money, uh, money multiplier is being more cyclical also. And, uh, yeah. Liquidity effect uh, changes in money supply and their effects on nominal interest rates. So, what are we seeing here? Uh, the real interest rate is closely and so is M1. CPI inflation is a good proxy for inflation expectation and perhaps. So that's the part I think is a little tenuous anyway. Is CPI inflation a good proxy for inflation expectations? Um, and in the absence of ex-ante measures, it's kind of hard to think about this. The RBI was not very happy when they found out and it was possible because when you're booming you should be, you should be curbing uh, 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 
again, uh, uh, this is what we get on, on, on the data. Um, it would be really great if, if you guys if you guys take it upon yourselves to, to to redo this with new data or all current proxies and see whether it's see whether it's more out. Okay. Okay, so this is with the backstreet filter. More or less, things are replicated, and um, this is with the 20-year time period before. So you have to do all these sensitivity tests, and that's the thing about applied time series papers: is you have to really hit it with 10 things in order to draw a robust inference on 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 your on your conclusion. Okay, now what is um, what do other papers other uh, other papers say? So let me quickly go over um, uh, uh, Rand and Tark. Are you familiar with this? Paper, which is also an earlier one, came out in yeah, 2002, so it's quite dated actually. But they point to some other things that are useful to know, although they're not the complete things we want to explain by theory. What they show is that the average length of business cycles in developing countries is much shorter, it's between 7 and 18 quarters, roughly 4.5 years. There are also fewer, fewer co movements in terms of common peaks and troughs, it's this whole issue of business cycles being synchronized. Uh, and developing countries typically move relatively quickly from uh, uh, from peak to tough trough and and, 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 and vice uh, versa. Uh, in the Indian context, I would have thought three years ago uh, when we were in a slump, and in some ways we are still in a slump. That with all that installed capacity, as soon as demand picks up, we would be able to boost out fairly fast, and that could be one reason why you just get out of a downturn quite. Uh, but for a variety of structural reasons, that hasn't happened. But this seems to be pointing to the fact that you move from peak to trough and vice versa quite quickly. Um, anyway, these are average expansion lengths and contraction lengths, and average uh, lengths of the business cycle for different continents. Um, but what they find in terms of their main conclusions is, is that you do have higher output volatility. They temper that result by saying that it's not that much compared to OECD countries. It is more volatile, but not by that much. Consumption is generally more volatile than output. That seems to be there for a robust fact that matches India as well as a lot of other EMEs and DEs. Um, but they also find in terms of volatility, not that much significant volatility between developing economies and EMDs in imports, exports, terms of the trade, and the real effect of exchange rate. Um, so there isn't that much difference in volatility in terms of cross correlations. Foreign trade in general is counter cyclical. That's something we will pick up on. Consumption and investment are strongly post-cyclical, and inflation is negatively correlated with output. So this is the argument that as you hit the upward supply side shock because the price of oil goes up, for instance, output falls and inflation goes up. So you get these um, inverse cross correlations um, for there. So it's more or less consistent with what we find in the India case, but we have more variables, I think, and therefore um, basically provides um, information on what's happening in the economy across the board. Okay, so that's as far as the numbers are concerned. So is it actually that the results about the procyclic energy or non-procyclic energy of inflation conclusive in terms of, like, is it that people have said that this is actually how it goes, like, across all the empirical studies? These are correlations, so uh, uh, you need something. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you need something like an identified bar or something that's much more sophisticated to really say that, uh, to identify your shocks, right? Uh, so these are correlations. These are just saying that when you have a, a, a burst in output relative to trend, it seems to be matched by um, uh, a reduction in inflation relative to trend. It's a correlation. Yeah, but okay, so because the I mean, when we think about the relationship between output and inflation, we would also look at, like, for example, if we look at covariance and frequency domain, we would see that there this relationship doesn't go very closely. Yeah. So in that sense, we can have a place where output is increasing, but inflation is also increasing because of a variety of factors. Right. So um, that would like, be very different from what we are trying to explain. No, but you can you can you can write out things in the time domain as well, right? I mean, as a as a, as a, as a, as a as once you get the spectrum, so. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a tricky.
tricky question. I mean, I, I guess here you, you uh, I mean, you don't need to go to the frequency domain to say that these results, these results will be reversed. I think you need to be much more careful in terms of identifying the shocks. That's what, what you can do in a regular time series analysis uh, in the time domain. Yeah, I mean, I was just trying to ask you how robust this stylized fact is in terms of like trying to explain it. Yeah, um, uh, at, at this point, I would say that this just this is a correlation. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 it, it's, it's a statistically significant correlation compared to other time periods. Um, have we done an exercise where we try and identify some of these shocks? Uh, at this point, we haven't. Uh, so, so, um, so, Professor, does it just apply to the more recent window of 1990 to 2010, this particular observation and it changes, yes, that's right. So that's what she's asking is that it, it, it becomes from demand shocks being more important in the post liberalization period yeah. to uh, uh, supply shocks being more important. And that, that accords with common sense is that you would think productivity shocks are, are, are cru crucial in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a regulated, blocked economy where, you know, uh, and, you know, where consumption is low. Uh, and as consumption grows, then it kind of moves uh, and, and determines how you get out behavior more. Uh, but I think that this is a very good question. It needs to be crushed out more to, to check, to identify these shocks properly. Yeah, okay, so then what do we take away from this literature? See, our lens of the data is through theory, right? So we have the theory in our, in our head and we have the energy economy is 15. And I tell you, they are having more or less the uh, same characteristics like uh, countries are having for only current account that zero, like uh, have very small, uh, small current accounts, suppose like in case of China and India. If you color both, uh, you would not have it, like one is like domestic with a demon and another is export or anything. Like, uh, we have some. Yeah, it's not it's not sample wise. It, 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 they, they do robustness checks on, on much bigger samples than this. Uh, in, in this particular case, a lot of EMEs are middle income countries, so uh, in, in that sense, they're a little uh, similar. But uh, in other papers, like uh, a working paper by Mali, it's a whole set of uh, uh, countries which are structurally different. So the facts that are emerging out of that are are uh, uh, not specific to the sample that you you chosen. But you're right, in this, in this you do get a little bit of that flavor that these are all of a particular end of level. But what, what we take away from, um, from, from all this empirical literature is that, um, that real GDP tends to be, uh, uh, um, um, uh, if you look at uh, private consumption, it, it tends to be real, consumption tends to be more volatile. You also get uh, counter-reciprocal trade balances. So this is counter-reciprocal in advanced economies, but you get far more stronger countries with Cali numbers for trade balances in, in EMEs. And the third fact that is uh, relevant to this analysis is that you have counter-cyclical uh, interest rates. Three things. You have higher relative consumption volatility, counter-cyclical cart accounts, and counter-cyclical interest rates. Okay. Those are three things that you tend to pick up. So this why are only a different that was interesting why are similarities of interest I mean, I would say that why is the fact that private consumption and investment are both the orders of the same uh, contemporaneous correlation is also interesting to that. Because given the light of other variables, you would also expect some differences here. The yeah, fact that similarities should also be interesting, right? It is. It's just saying that, you know, that consumption responds to changes in output as much as investment responds to changes in output. Um, uh, is that interesting? Let's look at the recent Great Recession. What do we see in the, what are the facts for the most recent financial crisis? You see consumption plummeting, you see investment plummeting, you see labor force participation rates going down. Okay, that's a part of the labor market that is being explained by these models. But if you say consumption and investment are plummeting, um, you would think that's typically being driven by output going down as well. Uh, something you want to explain, or is that something that seems to be fairly? But 
the contrast between developing and emerging economies. What did we expect? The consumption investment to be relatively more stable in emerging economies than the developing economies because they were imperfect in the emerging economies. Could be. But the numbers are the same. So why yeah. is well, I mean, for one, uh, consumption in EMEs is slightly lower than as a percentage of GDP as advanced economies. In the US, its consumption is roughly 70% of GDP, whereas in India, it would be in the early 60s. So it's still a big chunk of it. It's still a big chunk of it. So it's not so much the, 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 the denominator, the size of the denominator, but as much the fact that the ratios are solid you know, between a 0.5 and 0.6 range. Um, so you would think that if income fell, then its impact on consumption would probably be similar. Uh, I agree. That's probably a good way to go. Um, yeah. So my only, I guess, my only answer to that is that 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 uh, the fact that output falls would maybe have a similar effect on consumption, investment, and EMEs and DEs as well uh, to the to the usual channels. Okay, so that's that's one approach to trying to build models to understand this. Now, um, so I don't know what you did in Aldo Jory's class, but did you work out a small open economy RBC model, or was it just a standard closed economy model? It was closed. It was sort of the steward's entity going into the study of all the different banks, etc., which had the model. Okay, so what are the components of that model? Just describe a closed economy RBC model with a temporary but I'm going to be shocked. Do you have references? references. Right? Technology. Yeah. There's a technology. Right? There are factor inputs that produce yeah. a final good. And in every period that thing is shocked by a technology process. Right? Make sense? And what is the consumer's decision? Consumer has to make the choice between consuming now or later and how much market time to supply out of a fixed time endowment. Correct? Yeah. Okay. And um, you can solve this model by doing what? What's the object? What do you want to do from once you write up, once you set up the problem? Then you want to do what? Transition values. Yeah, you want to figure out the household's decision rules. Yeah. Right. And you can do that by setting up the Lagrangian, or you can exploit the fact that the problem is recursive and therefore solve it as a as a, as a deterministic dynamic program or a stochastic dynamic program. That will give you decision rules for the household as a function of the state variables of the economy, which is the capital stock and the shock. Okay. Now, okay, so now what we want to do is. Um, Look at a small open economy variant of that, where you have international financial transactions over a, uh, a riskless bond. Okay, so it's a non-contingent bond, and it's small open economy, which means that your economy basically takes the world interest rate R star as given. Okay, so that's what is going to be uh, uh, structured open. And you're going to have trend productivity shocks. Those are the two major kind of changes to the standard closed economy framework that generates um, that leads to that leads to a VR and Mokinat's Mokinat's paper. So, um, and, and what what motivates us to think of um, uh, uh, adding trend productivity shocks? And here, Mokinat say that basically the fact that developing countries have these large regime changes that allows us to with these shocks. And coming to trend productivity. You can think of friction, by the way, as being not only being like working capital constraint type financial frictions, but you could also think about labor market frictions. So this is this whole work by uh, uh, 
Chris Pissaridis on search and matching frictions in labor markets because. Uh, because we usually augmenting it. No, 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 no. We get this functional form because we want the model to generate observations that are more consistent with EME data. That's what we want to do. It doesn't have to do with the functional form on technology. We've assumed trend productivity shocks to allow for the fact that there may be a permanent income hypothesis channel that explains higher consumption norms. And we allow for GHH preferences. And the property of GHH preferences is that the marginal rate of substitution only depends on the real wage and not consumption because it's of this form U of C minus G of L. So that's important to understand is that you have preferences that, um, that uh, uh, kill off the income effect. So that's the terrorist tool. So you have, you have a trend shock for productivity and you have, you have GH preferences. Okay, now on the um, budget constraint, so you have a household, uh, the household consumes, it invests, there is output produced in every time period. If you break one minus delta there, that's just your investment. Change in the capital uh, 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 stock are costly, and that's the adjustment cost of capital. It's parametrized by that functional form. There's debt that needs to be paid off, and then there's debt that you issue at price Q that augments your proceeds in time period T. Then, this is an important paper by schmidt Brohe. One of the ways to make the steady state, the non-stochastic steady state, behave nicely is one of many techniques, but the price of that, which is QT, is going to give you the interest rate, right? Which is 1 over QT, which is going to be 1 plus R. That's going to be fit down by the foreign interest rate, R star, because it's all over the plus a country spread risk that is due to departures from your debt relative to some steady state level. So this just tells you is that if you're going to issue debt, you're only able to issue it at a higher rate if your debt exceeds some steady state value, B. Okay? That's one way in which you can um, uh, make the stochastic steady state. Uh, so that's Q, that's the price of your bond, and that's one we do. That's the inverse of the price of the bond, which is your interest rate. So there, is this, there are various ways to do this. So this rule over here, this um, psi times E, B plus 1 over gamma T minus B, is basically something that encapsulates a more general rule. It's called a um, uh, semi-elastic interest rate rule, um, which basically means that your interest rate depends on the foreign interest rate plus this premium term over here. So the larger you are relative to some steady state value, the more you have to uh, 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 you're only going to be able to float this debt at a higher rate. And in the steady state, where you are at this d tilde, then d minus d tilde is zero, e to the zero is one, one minus one is zero, and your interest rate premium is nil. Okay? So that's the idea behind this device over here. So do you understand? Do you see that on the technology side you have transitory and uh, uh, permanent shocks? On the preferences side, you can play around with plot doubles and GHH preferences to get differing income and substitution effects for changes in insurance. And then you close them on by a set of constraints that summarize uh, the household's uh, uh, choices uh, over, 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 over the people set. Now, if you're going to solve this model, um, so your ultimate goal is to basically take this model to the data. So you log in your it and you get your um, uh, competitive um, you have to normalize things because you're interested in a stationary competitive equilibrium. Because gamma t is floating around, so things are trending, right? So you want to detrend things uh, 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 so that you get a stationary competitive equilibrium. Well, just remember that, that a, the steady state is uh, a special kind of a balanced growth path where things grow at a zero rate. Usually, when we think about balanced growth paths, it's, it's a balanced growth path is a situation where Bunch of variables grow at constant, all at different rates. And the steady state is a, is a special case of that, where, where things grow. Everything grows at the same rate. But it's, so we normalize, even in the solar model, we do y over al, because 
why tilde is going to grow as a grow at a zero rate uh, in, in the steady state. So if you take a stationary transformation over here, um, you're going to get um, any variable x dot t to be this. And we know that this is an infinite horizon economy, so also we're making choices over time. You can uh, solve this by, uh, uh, by just writing out your problem as a, as a, as a recursively in terms of a, a dynamic program. So that's your value function at time period t, and that's your continuation value. And this ft here is going to become different because you're going to have this gamma t minus 1 uh, floating around. I'm happy to derive this for you if you want. But if not, uh, 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 you're going to get. Uh, does something like this look familiar to you, to, to you guys? Uh -huh. So macro, this should be second nature. Yeah. Uh, when you see this, you should you should know how to to approach it. Then you're going to detrend everything as well. So you have to divide by gamma t minus one, uh, kt plus one. Uh, uh, there's going to be a gt here because you have. Uh, gamma t over gamma t minus 1, and again, cross, cross multiply. You, you, kind of, you, you carry through this, this habit thing for, for all, of your, all of your variables. And then, um, once you do that, you can solve for c hat t in terms of this stuff here, put everything to the right, and take uh, a set of first order conditions, and then you have your standard envelope conditions. So these are going to be your first order conditions for your choice variables. The three variables that the household is going to choose is how much to save, what its future capital stock is going to be, how much debt, or how much it's going to borrow, and how much labor it's going to supply. Those are the three variables that the household will choose. The optimal values of those variables given by these first order conditions. And then you get these two envelope conditions on the state variables, right? So you equate the partial derivatives of your value function with respect to the two state variables to that on the right hand side. Then, remember that all of this stuff is written in terms of u partial c, but we have these utility functions. We have parametric forms for these utility functions. These are either top buttons or GHH, so we can evaluate these partials. And throw them into the model. Should I do one of these for you? Maybe we should. You guys want to practice some algebra? Yes? No. No? No. The fact that you have GHH preferences, so you have a functional form for your preferences, so that U partial C will then, um, this term here will replace the U partial C, and you derive your first order conditions. Those are my three first order conditions. Remember that we are optimizing over K T plus 1, B plus 1, and L. Those are the three variables that maximize utility. And then you um, take a logarithmic approximation of these equilibrium conditions above, and then you have all your constraints as well. Um, okay, and then that gives you a sense of the uh, theoretical part of the model. So to sum up, on the theory side, what we have are trend shocks. We have top levels and GHH preferences, and we have a small open economy model. Uh, um, where households borrow to finance uh, their consumption um, in every time period T, which are non consumption bonds. Okay, now let's get to the results. Um, so, what these guys find is they have data for Mexico and Canada from the time period 1980 to 2003. So Canada is a country they think of being advanced and therefore less um, characterized by trend shocks. Makes sense. Their economic policy regimes are stable. 
there's inflation targeting, there's some fiscal rule in place, they're advanced, they're, you know, they're able to absorb. So they think of Canada as being uh, a country ex ante that would um, uh, generate estimated values of sigma g and sigma z to be uh, less than one. Make sense? And they think of Mexico being more prone to these kinds of kind of new shocks. So when they estimate this stuff using the Calvin filter, they end up getting uh, these values for Canada and they end up getting these values for uh, Mexico. So that seems to accord with their theory. They end up showing that you get sigma g over sigma z to be 0.25 and 0.41 for Canada, and for Mexico it tends to be 0.5 or 5.4. Um, in other words, for the less developed country, the relative importance of the trend shock is higher. Okay? So their main finding is that the volatility of innovations is much stronger in the permanent technology process than in the trans transient one. And this leads to a major role of trend shocks. Okay? Now, as I said, there are no frictions in the model, right? So what the Chang and Fernandez paper is basically saying is maybe you're overstating the importance of trend shocks if you don't have friction in the model. Okay? The relative importance of frictions may come out if you do um, a various decomposition analysis or if you look at uh, uh, do some kind of Bayesian estimation uh, uh, and then use um, uh, uh, the parameters of the posterior distribution to generate a response functions or do a various decomposition, maybe the trend shock. Uh, this is not that important, but what they do find is, what this paper is highlighting, and I think this is where it's important, is, is until now we haven't really seen this this mechanism as being important, and, and, I, and I think this is where it's, this novelty is, that it, it, it leads to an argument for uh, uh, the relative importance of, of, of trend shocks. Now, um, there um, is a uh, well-known uh, criticism of the Aguirre Gobinan paper, which is uh, by Garcia Chico. I'll just summarize this um, uh, uh, very briefly. Um, so what they say is that uh, the fact that you get uh, an importance of, of, of a trend shock may have to do with the fact that you have a fairly small uh, time period. In other words, your data goes from 83 to 2010. So what Garcia Chico do is they get data for Argentina from 1900 to 2010. So that's 110 years of observations. And they find that um, that the relative importance of trend shocks actually goes down quite a bit once you look at a larger, a larger sample. So this is a further issue we also had in our business cycle paper about choosing the right time frame as well, and the results being an artifact of the time frame you consider. So they basically have a, a longer time series, um, and when they work with uh, long run Argentine data, um, they actually estimate that um, your sigma consumption is less than your sigma growth, that's one thing they get in terms of uh, 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 that, which means that there's, you know, there's evidence that there's consumption moving. Um, and they also find that the variability of your trade balance tends to be uh, much, much higher than uh, the variability of your, of your output, okay? which is again something that is not, 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 not uh, uh, relevant in, in the data. This is using annual data, right, from 1900 to 2010. Okay. And then Chang and Fernandez say that when you actually do an encompassing model, uh, the trend shocks are actually play a very little role in, 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 in many EMEs. And, 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 and they actually also say that the working capital constraints, you don't know what working capital constraints are at the moment, but that's one of the frictions of the Chang model. Um, uh, what seems to be mattering in explaining EME stylized facts is not so much trend shocks, but it is. It is transitory shocks and, and frictions and financial frictions. And once you begin to add those things, the relative importance of trend shocks uh, goes down by a lot. Okay, so, um, and then there's a criticism on the autocorrelation function. The data predicts uh, a, a downward sloping autocorrelation function, but uh, the model seems to generate the trade balance out of the ratio as a as a random walk, so there's again a source of a source of discrepancy. Uh, okay, so that's where we are. Now we have 20 minutes, so let's do some algebra just to get a sense of 
the model? Okay.
we need that because in our dynamic program, we're going to be maximizing utility as a function of consumption and labor supply with either GHH or public preferences. So we need to take that consumption and put that in there. OK, so that's just step one, just for you guys to get a feel of how the algebra works. Now, let's look at the value function. Can I, one is how much it's going to save, how much uh, it's going to borrow, and the third one is how much it's going to work. What would happen if labor supply was also trending? Labor supply is constant, right? What if labor supply was trending? What if your preferences were such that labor supply trended? It would just detrend and it would go to? It could go to zero, right? And that means it will produce no output. So your preferences have to be consistent with the fact that labor supply is constant. Um, that's something that we know from theory. Okay, so uh, what is my first order condition for k hat t plus 1?
F, F okay. sorry. That's the function F. Okay, let me summarize. Um, so we have a set of empirical regularities that are different from advanced economies. Countless typical carbon counts, higher consumption volatility, and countless cool interest rates. What theory is consistent with this fact? So what we presented is a model um, where you have trend and temporary productivity shocks. You have um, preferences which are uh, Aguirre and Gopinath work with uh, complex as well as GHH preferences. And you have a small one on new model. And the model generates um, moments that are consistent with these empirical regularities, which makes us think this may be a good way to explain any business cycle. And the reason why the model explains these business cycle regularities is by virtue of the fact that we've added a trend shock to productivity in the model. And when we add a trend shock to productivity in the model, we identify um, the identification mechanism becomes the permanent income hypothesis, which means that a trend shock is an increase in your permanent income, which means that uh, your consumption increases relative to your current income, and therefore that leads to higher consumption volatility, but it also leads you to, uh, uh, to borrow, uh, which leads to a, a cyclical current account. So at this point, we're at a stage where we have a model that explains these empirical regularities, but we've seen that in the criticism by Garcia Chico that uh, with a longer time series, um, you, 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 you resurrect the fact that transitory shocks actually tend to be um, uh, uh, fairly important, um, in fact, equally important, um, and with various features of, of, of the, the Argentine data suggesting that a longer time period may be, may be uh, that the IPR broken up is also not robust to a longer time period. And then all the other moments are also then, uh, look like they're, they're, they're slightly off. If you look at the volatility of, of investment or if you look at the volatility of the trade balance relative to output, they all tend to not accord with um, uh, what we observe um, in the data. So uh, what we'll do um, in the next session is we're going to try and move towards an encompassing model. Is that a model where here we have trend shocks, but now we'll look at interest rate shocks, and then towards the end we'll go to the Chang Fernandez paper where we have everything. That's what we're moving. We're moving in bits and pieces towards an encompassing model where there are frictions and a variety of shocks. Okay? So when we return at 2 p.m., we'll talk about the mechanics of the interest rate shock model and see how that could be did or fit to thinking about Indian business cycle.